This is the Everything Saxophone Podcast with Donna Schwartz and Nick Manella, episode number nine. Hey everybody, welcome back to episode number nine of the Everything Saxophone Podcast. Hope you are doing well. Hope you are having a great week so far. I am so excited to bring you this week's episode with the great John Arabagon. He is one of my favorite saxophone players ever in the world, in the universe. I know I say that every single time I present you with an interview, but that's one of the best things about this show is I get to interview the people that I really, really love to listen to. And hopefully you guys like to listen to these artists as well. So John is uh, just a fantastic human being, a really, really nice guy. He was very, very generous with his time. And we got into a whole lot of stuff, including his brand new album, Dr. Quixotics, Traveling Exotics. Uh, This album comes out next week, May the 15th, but it's actually already out on Bandcamp. And we talk about where you can get this record. And I have to say, I highly recommend this album in the truest sense of recommending something to you guys out there, you got to check it out. It is just fantastic from beginning to end and uh, very, very excited for you guys to hear this music. He was nice enough to send me an advanced copy and I just can't stop listening to it. So before we jump into today's episode, a few housekeeping things. Uh, First, Donna and I just want to really thank you for tuning in to all of these episodes helping getting our show off on a great foot. A lot of people out there engaging on the Facebook page, uh, leaving us ratings and review on iTunes, which we totally appreciate because that just really helps us get out to more folks just like you. If you haven't done that already, just jump onto our iTunes page and leave us a five-star rating and review. Let us know what you think about the show, and that's just going to spread the message of uh, these great, great saxophonists to more folks out there. So if you wouldn't mind taking two seconds out of your life and doing that, that would be great. Also, join in on the discussion on our Facebook page. Just search for Everything Saxophone Podcast on Facebook. Drop us a like, and we will keep you up to date on everything that is happening. There's also all of our back episodes are available at our website, saxophonepodcast.com. If you head over there, you can find every single interview that we've done so far, along with some other kind of cool stuff. You can also jump on the mailing list, get our free gift to our mailing list subscribers, the best five saxophone warm-up tips, and also you will get an email every week letting you know that the new episode is out and anything else that we are doing at the show that might be of interest to you. So I think that's it from my end. I know you guys really want to hear from John. Uh, In this episode, we start by talking about his brand new record. And then we also talk about how somebody as busy as John kind of situates their life uh, in order to be able to play with all of these great artists that he's playing with, making records of the highest caliber, and also finding a little bit of time for yourself Uh, We also talk about some of the things he does with his students, some of the projects that he's currently involved with as a sideman, as well as a leader. We also talk about one of the most intimidating uh, transcription projects that I've ever heard of a human being doing. And John talks about how he's handling this project and some of the benefits that are coming from it. Uh, This is just a fascinating thing to talk to somebody like John about, and it shows you his dedication uh, and the depth that he's willing to go on the instrument to kind of get where he wants to be. I also ask my five questions of John that I ask everybody that comes on the show, and I think a lot of the answers are very, very illuminating and uh, very important. We also talked to John about uh, playing some of the lesser known saxophones, like the Sopranino saxophone, the mezzo uh, saxophone. I don't don't even remember really what it's called, but John really goes into detail about why he chooses some of these much lesser known instruments and really, really digs into 
making them sound as good as possible and exploring these other realms, or as he calls it, taking the black hole to the other side on playing some of these instruments. All right, enough from me. Let's get into the episode. Uh, without further ado, help me welcome the great John Arabagon onto the podcast. Oh, I wanted to just like jump right into talking about the new record, um, Dr. Chaotic's Traveling Exotics. And uh, <laughs> you were nice enough to send me an advanced copy and it's like, it's just been living in my CD player, man. And it's made, awesome. a, made a real impression on me. So first of all, the first question I got to ask you, who the heck is Dr. Chaotic? <laughs> <laughs> He's a, it's, um, yeah, so the whole concept of the record is basically, uh, Circus, okay. fun house mirrors, freak shows, you know, the slightly macabre kind of kind of thing. And what what led to that kind of idea was, you know, as musicians, we're on stage and we're playing and we're just start taking for granted all the great feats that the people around us are doing. You know, I've been playing with Rudy Royston for well over a decade now and like it, one gig, I just took a step back. I'm like, well, the thing that he's doing on the drums is just insane. Like, it's superhuman. Mm -hmm. You know, and the same with Yasushi on bass and the same with Luis Perdomo on piano. I'm just, when I do take a step back and listen to them, I'm like, this is pretty incredible. And I have to, rem I, I have to remind myself, these are like amazing things that are going on around us all the time and be thankful about it. So mm -hmm. the, the germ of the idea came from that, that realization. And then I said, well, these guys are... These guys are like freaks in the best possible way. Let's travel around and do a freak show with them. I'm like, wait, that's actually what touring is. Right. <laughs> We're traveling to freak show. So I created the idea of this guy, Dr. Quixotic, who's who's the who's the ringleader and the presenter of everything. And uh, and he just kind of he organizes everything and he kind of presents the band to the people. <laughs> that's awesome man so it's quixotic not chaotic yes yeah, cool. yeah. all right that's good to know so you know talking about the band a little bit more i mean such a ridiculous ensemble of players you already mentioned everybody's name and you've also got tim hagan's on trumpet um so i know that you've been playing with this this particular band for a long time what kind of keeps you coming back to these particular musicians and you know making records with these guys Right. Well, the rhythm section with Luis and Yasushi and Rudy, we did a record on my label back in 2015 or 16, mm -hmm. I want to say, called Behind the Sky. And that was like the compositions were a little more streamlined and, and it, the performances were geared towards more mainstream kind of right down the middle mm -hmm. kinds of things. But we had already been playing as a quartet for years before we decided to make that first record. And since that record's come out, we've toured Europe and we've toured in the States and South America. And it's just great to see these guys grow. And it's also great to see myself get challenged in both performing and improvising ways because those guys are pushing me so hard, but also compositionally, how do I keep them interested and how do I keep them challenged um, when playing in my band and yeah. playing my music, you know, we all play in other people's groups and in each other's projects. So, um, the compositions for, for this record were written with them specifically in mind cool. and with Tim Hagen's in mind too, cause he's jumped on board and, um, yeah, just trying to find a way to keep things fun, keep things interesting and also challenging both as my, for myself as an improviser and as a composer. Now, do you guys feel like you've developed as a band over the years and really started to like develop that connection of, all right, we've been playing together for a long time now. We've done several recordings. Um, what's it been like watching the progress of this, this particular group of musicians? Oh, I mean, you know, every different band and every different group of musicians, yeah. the, the dynamic is completely different and the little inside things are a little different. But a lot of the things that happen on this record, on Dr. Quixotic's Traveling Exotics, some of the, like the more open stuff, that stuff happened in the studio for that take. And it didn't ever happen again for any yeah. of the other takes or any of the other performances. So we really captured, I mean, we recorded that record in the middle of a tour in South America. And it was right in the process of right in the, in the cracks where they were starting to be really comfortable with the music and the roadmaps and the forms and everything, mm -hmm. but it was still new. So a lot of chances were being taken and a lot of, uh, just just going for it. Mm -hmm. um, and so we captured the band at the 
exact right moment in the studio because we happened to have a day off and we jumped into the studio and, and it was couldn't be more happy with the results and some of the stuff you hear on there are it's the band really interacting right. in the moments and uh, like i said some of the stuff hasn't happened since or or before those takes so right well that's interesting because yeah. you kind of touched on something i wanted to to ask you um one of the coolest things is the liner notes to the record um, uh-huh. So, so one of my favorite things is, uh, you know, Doctor Quixotic says these are not earworms for the faint of heart or distracted radio loving hipsters. No, these <laughs> six labyrinthine suites were constructed to take you on a journey of the mind, and like that's that's what I really hear when I listen. Like these are, they seem to be more sweets than just like tunes, like head charts or something like that. Right, um, right, right. How did you write? such like involved and lengthy compositions, but still leave a lot of room. I guess what I'm kind of asking is like, what do the charts kind of look like? I mean, is there, <laughs> is it, is it a lot of written material, not a lot of written material directions? Do you kind of let the band just take it where it's going to go? Um, how did you approach the writing for it? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. I mean, you know, earlier in my career, I've put out um, a lot of free improv, just straight 50 minute, mm-hmm. 75 minute blowing sessions where there wasn't really much material. And I, I originally came to jazz and improvising from that kind of angle. Okay. But as I've been able to play in a lot of people's bands like Dave Douglas's and Mary Halverson's and Barry Altschul's, a lot of these band leaders that I play with, they have really intricate music. And at mm-hmm. first I was kind of like, okay, well, how does this combine with the improvisational setting that I kind of prefer to to be it and after years of getting the tour around with a lot of these different people i started realizing the composition is really it's a really great it can be a really great springboard Mm -hmm. and lead to some different kind kinds of interactions and improvisations that i wouldn't get to if i was just straight up improvising and free free freely improvising with people so after years of that i i did behind the sky and and the point of that record with this ensemble was to do really mainstream down down the middle as as mainstream as I'm going to go mm-hmm. writing and it was always with the intent that a couple of years down the road with some touring under our belts that I was going to start writing a little bit more intricate material that still breathes that still has life and still is fun but you know I might not have ever written in nine before right. you know and so and so some of these compositions were outgrowths of these goals that I wanted to really extend myself compositionally, but, but also keep it interesting and leave a lot of room for the interaction that I love about this particular ensemble. So it was definitely on purpose, the, the really long suites, and it took a lot of trial and error in the practice room and a lot of trial and error in the rehearsal room with those guys. And some of the charts, I could send them to you, and you know, some of them have really specific piano, piano parts that eventually on the record, we decided, okay, Louis, like refer back to this really specific, intricate thing I wrote, but really just go for that vibe. Right. One, one of the charts have a really specific drum chant in it that I heard Rudy doing, and on the chart, uh, on the performance itself, Rudy is referring to it, but really he's bringing his own life and creativity to it, and it's better than anything I could have written out. That's cool. So it, it was a big process for myself as a co- composer, but also it, the band grew incredibly during the the process of uh, making these six suites uh, come to life because now now when we play it's a whole different ball game right well that's great i always love to ask about that because it's like you're listening and then at least from a musician's point of view at least i when i'm listening i'm always kind of wondering about you know what are the musicians looking at what are they referring to how much of this is written out um how much of it is the work of the composer and how much of it is the work of the band, you know? Yeah. I mean, this particular album, there is, I mean, part of the reason why each of the tunes are so long and they're sweet, like is because there is a lot of written material, but I loved, I want to keep the, the level of improvisation and and give each person as much space as they want or need to say what they want to say. Cause that's what I love about these musicians, yeah. you know, Tim Higgins and Luis anyways. Awesome. So, so, um, yeah. So part of it was, I wanted to reconcile it to be like each of these tunes need to be, it's just going to be as long as they're going to be, you know, right. I'm not worried about 
getting these songs played on some short format radio things because that's not what these compositions and this band is about at this point. Cool. Now, I also noticed that like most of the record is really like fiery, uh, very fast <laughs> tempo is really kind of in your face playing. It's, it's really inspiring. It makes me want to get up off my butt and go do <laughs> something. Um, was that more like, did you have the theme to the record of this kind of like traveling circus kind of thing while you were writing? Or was that like a byproduct of, of getting the music in the can and then realizing, oh, this could be a really cool concept for the record? Uh, it was, it was, it was like right down the middle, like in the middle of writing all the stuff, I'm like, okay, so what is the connective tissue for all this stuff and it's like man i love the energy and the interaction and just the the go get it attitude of these guys and Mm -hmm. so then that's kind of led to the whole theme but it definitely was an outgrowth of the material that i wanted to present with these guys i mean for me there's nothing in the world like playing with some high energy interactive jazz musicians that can refer back to the history of the music but put their own spin on it and really try to push something forward. And, and, uh, yeah, a lot of the music is high energy, but that's just these guys, uh, personalities coming out. Right. That's awesome. And, you know, but, you know, near the, near the end of the record, there's a, there's a ballad, there's a quote unquote ballad right, on right. it. And it's called pretty like North Dakota. And even that is the most, it's one of the most intense ballads that I've ever been a yeah, part of. I was going to say that. I was going to say <laughs> that, actually, because I was looking at the, the track titles and I'm like, oh, here's the ballad, you know, track five. <laughs> and then I started listening to it. And I'm like, man, it's just so much energy. I just I love that. <laughs> but like I said, it was captured in the middle of the tour. And I think you can we were having such a great time in South America. You know, we had some great wine and we had some great steaks mm-hmm. and the hangs before and after the gigs were just incredible. And so you can hear that. You can hear that energy, that kind of positivity yeah. and and group dynamic throughout the record. And that's why it's one of my favorite things that I've ever put out, you know, just just that love and that energy. Yeah, you can definitely hear it. Is that something you've ever done before, like recorded an album in the middle of a tour? Or is this the first time you've done that? Uh, I did. A, my, I, I have a trio with Barry Altschul and Mark Elias, mm-hmm. and we did, we did a live record called It Takes All Kinds. Okay. And that was recorded right at the end of a tour. Okay. And actually, funny enough, that band, we did a tour last year where we went through Amsterdam and Israel and a bunch of places in Europe. And I actually have a bunch of tapes from that tour. So that trio might be putting out another live record at some point. But this, this like being in the middle of a tour, capturing that energy and that excitement of, of a tour thing, but being in the studio, this was the first time that I kind of did that. And I wanted to see how that worked. And I'm super happy with the results. So maybe we'll do something like that again. Very cool. So one last question about the record, um, and that's the the artwork. Like the the yeah. artwork on this record is so cool, and I think like in an age where we're just so used to the extent of of record artwork being like a little image on iTunes that we can look at right. while we're listening to. It. I mean, you've got like a six panel CD that really has some of the most interesting images I've ever seen <laughs> on it. Um, what went into the design of the artwork? Was was a lot of it you, or did you have a designer that kind of brought the the visual aspect of the music to life? How did you handle that part of it? Well, so I started my own record label, Arabagast Records, mm-hmm. back in 2012. And part of the reason why I did that was I had some experience with some bigger and some smaller other labels, where eventually I just realized, you know, if I'm working for a large label or something like that, maybe the the final product or the most important part of making a record for some something like that, something of that scale, maybe it's not the actual music. Maybe it's not focused on a complete statement by the artist or something like that. So I wanted to put out, my, and plus playing with Dave Douglas and seeing how he's approached you know, his, his own label, and it, that was a big inspiration. So I wanted to just if I had my own record label, I could do, I could be in control of all aspects of the music and presentation of it. And with that comes a lot of responsibility. And like, you know, I, I'm more a musician than a business guy. So I'm totally content with leaving the label being pretty small, but, but the positive outcomes of that is that I get to control all aspects of it. So after this theme started coming into my head, I started doing a lot of research about what the artwork could be because there were a lot of possibilities with with this with this theme, and so I went through a lot of question and answers with with lawyers and like and and looking online about like okay, 
what can I do with, um, you know, like open use images and, and did I get in trouble for that kind of thing? And so that was an adventure in and of itself. But eventually I found this artist, this British artist named Colin Batty. And uh, he did some work on Mars Attacks, the Tim Burton oh, cool. movie. And I'm like, oh, well, that's the right aesthetic. Yeah. That's exactly where I'm trying to come from with this thing. And so I was in touch with him and some of his people that represented him. And he has these cabinet cards, and he has a whole series of hundreds of these things where he's taken old cards, old portraits from hundreds, of, you know, 100 years ago and more, and he's put like a supernatural, crazy, macabre element to those cabinet cards. So it's a perfect, perfect blend of like real and surreal and imaginative and just crazy and fun. Yeah. Some of them are fun. Some of them are dark. Yeah. Some of them are scary. And so it's exactly what I wanted to do with the music. And so I was able to iron it out with them that I was able to use, I think there's like 80, 75 or 80 of those cabinet cards on yeah. the artwork. And so the artwork for me is just as important as the music for this presentation. And like you said, you know, like physical CDs are, are people are buying them less and it's more right. about downloads and everything. And I'm, I'm trying to come to terms with that as right. far as like presentation and stuff. But for this record, it needed to have, I, I wanted to have the full 360 degree this is what this product is. This is what this package is. And this is what this music is saying. And so, yeah, it was my idea. I was lucky enough to find Colin and work, work it out with him. And I'm super happy. This might be some of my favorite artwork on anything I've ever been a part of. Yeah. It looks awesome, man. It's really kind of cool to sit and listen to the music and check out all the images and read the liner notes and all that stuff that like we used to do when we were a lot younger Oh yeah. Uh, before, before it just became like click play on the computer. Um, exactly. which, which yeah. is obviously so also great, but I mean, it's cool to, to have that, you know, thing in your hand. Yeah. And I, you know, I guess I'm a traditionalist in, yeah. in some ways as far as it goes with that. But we'll, I mean, we'll see, maybe the future of it is mostly downloads only, but for, right. for this particular record, I really wanted to have that artwork that tied together all the themes and, you know, the themes of just the Funhouse mirror stuff, the freak show, but also how fun and imaginative and just crazy it can be. Yeah. Awesome. So when does the album actually officially come out and uh, where can people get it? Yeah, uh, the the album comes out on May fifteenth, okay. uh, this twenty eighteen, and uh, you can pre order it on Bandcamp. The downloads are available. Uh, so you just go to Bandcamp and type in my name and look it up. It should be one of the first things to come up. Also, it's going to be available on iTunes and CD Baby and all the all the usual suspects on uh, May fifteenth. Awesome. All right. Well, we'll definitely link to the Bandcamp in the show notes, so everybody out there definitely check that out. Um, so moving away from the record, I guess, a little bit and more in terms of your career, like you're one of the busiest people in the world. Um, I look at your <laughs> schedule and it's just insane, like wall to wall, you're traveling everywhere. How do you keep up with all these different projects? And like one of the unique things I think about you is that you're a leader, but you're also like one of the most in-demand sidemen uh, in the business. So like, is it a goal of yours to stay that busy or is it just a way that it, does it just work out that people you love to play with ask you to, you know, do their projects all the time and you just end up as busy as you are? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. And the answer is like, it's a little bit of both. Okay. You know, if it, I, there is a ton of musicians that I've been able to play with recently that, uh, you know, they're my heroes, some of my heroes in the, you know, when I was growing up and first getting into creative music. And mm -hmm. so to get to perform with them, I'm not going to turn that down for anything in the world, you know? So some of it's just have, being able to have fun playing music. Some of it is getting to tour around to new places right. to see some new things. And some of it, you know, a lot of it is just getting a chance to work on where I want to go with music and how I see improvising and how I see messing with the saxophone <laughs> And uh, and luckily, I've been able to uh, get to perform and, and play with a lot of different people that also think similarly about their music or at least have some kind of creative aspect to their music that I want to be a part of. Right. So, you know, I don't mind being super busy, but, you know, there's definitely some some moments in the year where there's nothing that much going on and I can chill out and relax and focus on the next thing and work on stuff. And I'm fine with that, too. Yeah. 
but the point is to just hopefully just be involved in some really creative and fun music and hopefully I can just keep that going. I feel very lucky and fortunate to be playing with a lot of the people that I get to play with. And so hopefully that just keeps happening. Right. Now, do you protect a little bit of time on your calendar? Like you said, there's some parts of the year that like you do just get to chill out, maybe regroup a little bit and work on your own stuff. Um, you know, I think a lot of people out there that are professional musicians that are trying to like piece together a living. Um, sometimes it's like, well, I just basically have to say yes to everything that comes my way. Do you feel it's important to block off a little bit of time in your schedule to kind of do your own thing or just like sit on the couch and stare at the wall for a little while? Yeah, there's definitely, you need, you need to have some downtime and you need to have some, some other things that you're into outside of the hustle or whatever you want to call that or whatever. Um, so so, you know, it's difficult, but sometimes maybe before or after a tour, if it starts or ends in a really interesting place, I might just stay there for a couple of days and hang out. I definitely try to do a vacation with my wife every year where we try to go and do something where there's no instruments, there's no phones, and we just kind of block off our own thing. Yeah. Um, if I'm at home, I'll try to go to some baseball games or cool. or something, you know, uh, you've, you've got to have something else um, that can help revitalize and actually add new dimensions to the music thing that you're doing. Right. So you mentioned baseball. Is there anything else that you're into outside of music that you feel like kind of takes you out of that universe for a little while every now and again? Well, you know, I, you know, there's certain authors that I'm into. There's certain painters, Mm -hmm. there's certain movie genre things that I'm into. And like, you know, eventually it all comes back to what I wanted, how, how can I improve my saxophone playing? How can I come up with something more original of my own to say of and keep that, keep that track going? So, you know, I love David Foster Wallace. And part of the reason why I love his writing is because I feel some kind of connection to what he's saying with his art, with mm-hmm. what I'm trying to say with mine. And so, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll read, I'll try to read Infinite Jest again. <laughs> yeah. And I'll try to, in some way, it connects to what I want to, say with my music and so it is something outside of music but it also helps right. grow what i want to do with my own music and it's the same with any fine art or any play or any movie or anything that you'll go see cool so uh like keeping on like the sideman thing um you know you play with so many ensembles like you mentioned uh mary halverson and and a lot of the other bands you've been playing with i i saw you've been playing with maria schneider a little bit lately um, that's just like one of my favorite bands in the world. So I can't avoid Thank asking you. you a question about that. <laughs> it's like so rare that you see so many amazing musicians sharing the stage. And it's such like a testament to Maria's music, um, that all those people will join her. Um, how long have you been playing with them and what's, what's the experience been like? I mean, you know, she was, we, in high school, we played some of her music. Yeah. And since then, I've just been following her and I buy every record the day it comes out and I just mm-hmm. check everything out. Uh, yeah. She's definitely one of those heroes that I was talking about that I've been lucky enough to get to perform with. I've actually only done a few gigs with okay. her and I'm actually leaving tomorrow to play one more with her. Nice. And hopefully that keeps happening. Yeah. But like you said, all those musicians on that stage are just incredible and they play at the highest level and the most creative level. But they're also willing every single one of them is willing to be part of a team right and it's that kind of love for the music and look putting the music above any sort of ego thing that i love about maria's band and that i love about the band on my new record it's mm-hmm. it's the same kind of thing where you know the, the the musicians at the highest level have this understanding that i'm that i'm finding that like there's there's we all serve this higher thing that's creative music and improvisation. And so to be on a stage with 20 people that all have that same team mindset, but then when they get a chance to play, it's all out and they're really going for it 100% of the time. It's just, it's just incredible. And like you said, it's, it's a testament to her music, but it's also a testament to her vibe and her ideals and her goals in, in the music. And so that, those are the kinds of musicians and that those are the kinds of ideals that I want to be around. And, and like you said, like things have been super busy for me lately and I'm super lucky for that. But when you're in situations where you're around that, those kinds of feelings, Mm -hmm. it's revitalizing. It gives you life energy and you, 
you can, you could be completely exhausted from a 12 hour travel day followed by a 14 hour travel day, you know, but when you're on stage, that's the, uh, that's the payoff. That's the reward. Yeah. And, and those kinds of energies that are getting put out, that's what keeps me going in, in this whole business. Yeah, and I think that's unique to musicians because like a lot of jobs, it's just busy for busy's sake and you never get around to like the core of, you know, our time that we spend on stage while wow, there's all craziness surrounding it, traveling and all that kind of stuff. It's like at least you're doing it to spend that hour or two on stage expressing yourself at the end of the day, you know? That's right. Like, that's right. A lot of people that I travel with, they have a thing where they say like, you know what, when you're on, you, you get paid to do the travel. Part. Right, right. You get paid to sit in the airport for hours yeah. and, and like sit on a train for 10, 10 hours. Right. But when, and when, when you're on stage, you just do that for free because yeah. that's, that's the payoff and that's the thing that you love. And the more and more I travel and the more years go by, that's totally true. <laughs> yeah, that's good to hear, man. So this being like a, a saxophone podcast, um, I wanted to talk to you about your approach to the to the instrument a little bit. Um, you're somebody that plays all the horns at like an extremely high level. Do you feel you're equally attached to all the different horns you play? Or do you feel like there's one that's really your your voice? I'm really interested to hear your take on that. Well, I've been thinking about that a lot lately, actually. <laughs> it's funny that you asked that. Yeah. So so I play tenor and and everything above that on saxophone. I, and the baritone thing is I'm I'm really short, so the baritone thing just <laughs> it's, it's, it's too much for me. But but luck I've been lucky enough to play a bunch of I, I started on alto. Okay. That was my main instrument for many years. Mm-hmm. But I grew up in Chicago and Chicago has an amazing tenor saxophone history. Right. There's, there's such a great tenor saxophone lineage. And so when I started playing gigs in Chicago, there were some alto gigs, but the majority of gigs were for tenor saxophones. Okay. And so at that time, I was like, okay, well, I'm mainly an alto player, but I do want to work. I want to I want to have get some experience actually performing. So let me pick up a tenor. So I started playing tenor. When I finished school here in New York in 2005, I realized I'm like, man, so I love playing tenor. I love, I, alto is still a home base. Mm-hmm. I love playing tenor, but I have so many holes in my playing. There's so many like missing elements. You know, I had to sit down and, and be super honest with myself. And there's so many missing elements. I want to go through the tenor saxophone history, the lineage, and, and really try to get to know those key players so that with the goal of plugging any holes I might, or some of, some of the holes that I have in my playing. And so the last... 15 years or something have been really focused in the, in the, in the practice room on tenor saxophone and kind of shoring up some, some issues that I have with it. Cause it's there, you know, they're both alto and tenor are both saxophones, but really when you get down, to try to play each one at the highest level, they're really not doubles of each other. They're, right. they're their own instruments and you can't be an alto player and just switch to tenor and say, look, I, I I'm right there with, with right. all the tenor players. And so you have to put in the same amount of time. Yeah. Well, so it's actually been difficult to try to double on alto and tenor. It's like, it's it's a it's a big commitment. Yeah. But for me, they both get to different places and they want to say different things. Right. So it's inter- interesting, and I want to stay on that path for both of them. Yeah. Um, what are what are some of those like tenoristic things, or uh, some of those holes you felt like you discovered when you really got serious about the tenor? Like, is there anything specific you can kind of point to that you felt like? I really got to work on this. Well, I just, I just had an, an overwhelming sense that there was something that I was not. There was something that was like missing on the horizon. I yeah. couldn't place place what, what it was, and there's still things like that. So I'm still searching. But you know, as an alto player and studying, really getting into the history of the alto and studying a ton of Benny Carter and Johnny Hodges, mm-hmm. that was super important for my alto development. And you have to do that. If you're going to start playing tenor, you have to do that work with Coleman Hawkins and Lester right. Young. You, you know, there's no, there's no avoiding that. Yeah. And it's great because I have a bunch of students, college students in New York now, and some of them are super open to that. And some of them are just like, no, I just want to do my own thing. And I only want to listen to people 1965 and beyond. Right. And from my, from my perspective, I had to go back to Coleman Hawkins because that really, I still will, re- will refer sometimes to that vocabulary but more of the times to that sound or the vibe or that confidence or or the rhythmic thing 
I mean, it's really specific and it's really special. And you can start in 1968 and move forward, but then you're missing a certain thing that's been laid down. Right. And that's fine. And if you're going to start from 1968 only, I, you have to put in those thousands, 10,000 hours on what it is you want to do that really will make you singular. Right. And so part of the holes that I felt in my playing was I, I want to have those reference points to be able to refer back to you at the drop of a hat from Body and Soul from 39 right. and from those Lester Young, those key Lester Young solos, Lady Be Good and stuff like that. And I wanted to have, and I really put in that time, you know, during those years. And I might not have the time to shed or study Coleman Hawkins or Lester Young or Dexter Gordon these days, but the time that I put in, hopefully it'll still be there for some recall, you know? Right, exactly. Yeah, I was listening to um, Ben Webster uh, with a student yesterday and he had never heard Ben Webster before, man, he was freaking out because it's like so many times those guys get overlooked and then you present it to a student in such a way that they're like, you know, oh my God, like this is one of the best things I've ever heard. Um, and it's always kind of nice to see like a younger student reach way, way, way back and check those guys out. Oh, totally. You know, it's been, yeah. So I've been teaching here in New York college and high school and middle school students for you know, 12, 13, 14 years. Mm -hmm. And what's been interesting in that decade and a half is that the resistance to check out the earlier thing is becoming less and less. Right. And it's still there. And, you know, I, I'm not passing judgments or anything like that because, you know, when I was 15, 16, 17, 20 years old, I had similar thoughts to what super young students are. What do I need that for? Blah, blah, blah. That's not what interests me. But if you're really into a lifetime of music, that means you have, you, you know, you have 60 years to check out things. You, for myself, for, for my philosophy, you might as well, you owe it to yourself to, to check out these things because someone like Ben Webster is timeless for a reason. Right that sound on those ballads things like that was his superpower exactly <laughs> you know and so might as well benefit from the, the the glory of someone's superpower you know what i mean and so the resistance to checking out that that the older the the foundation of the of jazz music is is declining and i think it's a really good thing and hopefully in 10 15 years that'll be even be less mm -hmm. uh, and but the people and also encouraging the people that i've played with and have hung out with that have no interest in the jazz lineage of the music they're really motivated to find their own way whether whatever expression that's going to be mm -hmm. and that also is encouraging because not everything needs to be based in jazz but but a person needs to find and really define where they're coming from and be the best at that whatever that's going to be right and i think with saxophone we're so lucky because there's so much history and there's so many people who are really trying to push whatever their thing is forward. So mm -hmm. as far as wind instruments, I mean, saxophone might be the, the, the one that has the most development and the most possibilities and the, and, and the most directions that have already been made. Mm -hmm. And so kind of tying into that, like I play out, I started on alto, I expanded the tenor because of growing up from Chicago, but also, you know, you've got to play soprano. Right. But I got super interested in Sopranino saxophone. Yeah. Um, and I put out a solo record in 2015 that came out at the same time as Behind the Sky. Yeah. And it's completely opposite. You know, Behind the Sky is the most mainstream thing that I've done. And the solo Sopranino record, In Action is in Action, that might be the most the strangest record that I've ever put out. Mm -hmm. And so gearing up for that, at some, I got a Sopranino from Greg Osby. And I started practicing it, and I'm like, there is something completely different. If alto and tenor aren't even the same instrument when you get down to it, the sopranino is like on some other planet right. or some, some, some other universe even. Yeah. Um, you have to go through a black hole to even get to the planet <laughs> that, that sopranino is from. And yeah. so finding the possibilities – I mean you could play it like a quote-unquote saxophone, mm -hmm. and I practice doing that too. But also the possibilities – and the natural things that the Sopranino wants to do because it's such a different, the, the physics of this, such a smaller thing, et cetera, mm -hmm. tiny mouthpiece, et cetera, led to like a year's worth, of, a hard year's worth of like steady practice and focus on that thing. And it really has affected my alto 
and tenor playing as well. It like reverse affected it because I'm like, wow, well, if the Soprano can do this, this really strange creaky noise, mm-hmm. can I find a way for the alto to do it or a tenor to do it? And like, I never would have come to those noises on tenor or those sounds on tenor naturally on itself. But that year and a half, those two years of practice on the Sopranino and focus on it really has helped the other instruments. Right. I so, from, so from the love of the Sopranino, I was like, okay, what are some other saxophones that are out there? Yeah. And I, I bought a mezzo-soprano saxophone from cool. 1958, a con. Mm-hmm. And there's a solo record coming out on that wow. uh, later this year. Um, that I did in Norway. I found a, a mausoleum in, in Norway outside of Oslo. Um, and the reverb in there is almost 20 seconds long. Wow. And so I'm like, I have to record something yeah. here at some point. And so this this mezzo-soprano solo record was the right opportunity to, yeah. to do that. So it's funny, because the mezzo-soprano is so close to an alto, it doesn't naturally want to go in as crazy a place mm-hmm. as as a sopranino and so you know if the sopranino is you have to go through a black hole to get there maybe <laughs> when it's just outside of the milky way galaxy or something right. like that so there were some some more extended technique ex, extended technique ish yeah. sound i was able to mess with on on the mezzo but it definitely has a more home base in the alto and soprano worlds so this upcoming mezzo soprano record is a kind of a funny combination of the really experimental solo sopranino thing and more melodic textures and me messing around with forms like more traditional song forms to try to see what I could do with that as fo- and also messing with the room itself right how can i use that 19 second reverb to my advantage or how can I have it try to self-destruct in and up, in on itself? Yeah, for sure. And so this so this upcoming record, this that's gonna be the next thing that comes out on my label, probably in the fall or something like that. Cool. That's kind of the next step of solo instrument things that I'm messing with. And then in the process of doing that, I was able I was super fortunate and I found a slide saxophone Whoa. From, from the 1920s as well. So that's kind of uh just in my own practice room. Yeah, I've never now, even heard of the slide saxophone before. There, there were a bunch of different types that were made in the twenties. Wow! Um, and I was lucky enough, lucky enough to, lucky enough to find one. So there's going to be a slow slide saxophone record at some point yeah, in the future. Awesome. But, but there's going to be a lot. There needs to be a lot of hours put in to try to right. come up with to say something that's valid in my own mind. <laughs> so, so, like these instruments that are very. Uh, sort of untraditional in the saxophone world, like outside of just the straight four saxophone lineup. Um, yeah. So like you said, like going through a black hole to to play Sopranino. Now going through a black hole is very scary, right? Obviously. Uh, so how do you like reconcile that? Is that like, okay, I'm going to put in a bunch of time on this instrument that's super foreign to me and I'm just going to kind of go for it. Is that... How daunting is that to do? Or is it something that you're just super into and you love going through those black holes? I mean, it's both, but it's also liberating. Right. Because, you know, so at the same time, you know, I'm a Libra, so I've got all this balance. You know, I I don't really know much about that stuff, but I know that Libras uh, have this balancing. So at the same time where I'm tied to the jazz tradition and like, you know, I felt that I was... Be asking my way through playing tenor saxophone because I hadn't checked out much Coleman Hawkins and Lester Young and and the, the original cats. Mm-hmm. At the same time, I am completely into divorcing myself from the jazz tradition. And okay, well, the Sopranino doesn't really have much in the jazz tradition, if anything. So I want to focus on this instrument because of the possibilities that can it afford my playing and my improvisation and my philosophical sense right. be strictly because it's not tied to this history that's a hundred years old on yeah. saxophone and it's still a saxophone and I love the saxophone, but it has way less usage and the mezzo soprano saxophone digging into the history of that. I mean, Thomas Chapin sounds amazing on it and yeah. like something like, uh, the little rascals theme from yeah. that, that old TV show that was done on mezzo soprano. So, oh, wow. but other than that, there's not that much history to it. So mm-hmm. I like the fact that saxophone has so much history and I want to learn from it and I want to be a part of it. 
but I also am interested in these other saxophones because it's still a saxophone, but there's untapped potential with that. And it's daunting and it's scary. And a lot of times these experiments and the roads, that you, the paths that you go down mm -hmm. searching for these things can lead to dead ends. But there might be one doorway, one tiny doorway at the end of that dead end. And if you can find a way to open that up, mm -hmm. it could lead to a lot of different possibilities. And just like with this, uh, record that's, that's coming out in a couple weeks. I love the interplay and I love the fun of that. I love the interplay and the possibilities and the fun of these other saxophones. And what can we do here? What if I mess with this? What if I mess with that? And how can I tie these experiments back to some sort of jazz lineage sometimes mm -hmm. and just say, screw it. I don't want to be for these next five minutes. The thing that I'm going to play with this rhythm section is not going to be tied to anything that I've studied or learned. Right. Or the jazz lineage and that's just i mean that's my my own personality and that's me uh take like embracing those those possibilities that, that i love in my personality right and and being being able to uh separate the love for this music and the excitement and the fun of the improvisation and, and stuff from some sort of careerist uh idea of Oh, I'm gonna make sax. I'm gonna make saxophone music, and I want to have the most followers on Twitter. Right. I want to, I want to, I want to have the most Instagram like likes, yeah, or whatever like that. You know, like that kind of stuff doesn't really interest me. Mm -hmm. And there's positives and negatives to that, um, but I'm embracing both those positives and negatives, and embracing the fact that you know what, because I don't necessarily care about that aspect of the business. That means I can make a super experimental Soprano or a mezzo right. soprano record that the majority of the world won't care about, but that I truly feel passionate about. Well, that's really interesting because, like, you're so you, you're taking your career in your hands so much by by creating your own record label and um, doing really handling the business side of of being a musician. Um, is that also liberating? Is that one of the reasons that you did the record label and do all that kind of stuff? So you can just kind of do whatever you want. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Unequivocally. Yes. Cool. Um, you know, but I still, I love playing with, I think I'm very lucky in the way that it's all turned out that I'm really fortunate to be able to play with people like Maria mm -hmm. or Mary Halverson or Dave Douglas or Uri Kane or any, or any of these people. And, and that stuff is helping me you know, make month to month or year to year rent right. checks and, and, and eat and, and, and do things and fund my next records and things like that. Right. And so I'm very fortunate and I see it that way so that when I make my own records, it's really, you know, it's uncompromised right? for That's... wherever I, forever, for whatever kind of music I want to make. And, you know, and it's funny, the more, the deeper you get into this music and the deeper and the more people you meet around the world that are doing their own thing, there's so many different angles of this combination of inside outside music. There's right. so many degrees of angles of people out there. Yeah. And so once you start seeing that and becoming comfortable with that, you can really take a step back and be like, okay, who am I as a person? Right. Who, what am I, what do I want to say philosophically when I'm playing music and on the saxophone, what are the things I want to emphasize in my music? And one of the things I want to de-emphasize mm. and that in and of itself is a liberating thing. Right. And, and, and just being able to be comfortable in your own skin and be like, well, this is who I am as a person yeah. and it might change five years from now. Yeah. And I think but, you're like a, you're a really interesting example of that because, you know, I look back and, and like you won the monk competition in 2008, right. Which I think of as like a very traditional straight ahead uh, kind of setting. Um, you went to Manhattan School of Music, right? That's right. So is that was that pretty straight ahead uh, in terms of like an education? Um, but you're also somebody that just like reaches for, you know, and listening to your records, it's like, wow, I can genuinely say I've never heard anything like this before in a really good Thank way. Um, so I think that's so cool, man. Like just the the way that you're rooted in the tradition, you did all the hard work, you you did some of the traditional things that somebody does, but you have this freedom to kind of feel like you can do whatever you want. Where do you think that comes from, you know? I, man, I can tell you exactly for, for myself. It came from, uh, I mean, how do I even, 
<laughs> I've never, I've never had to like think about, I've never had to put it into words exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, so at a certain point when I finished school, so I went to Manhattan school, I went to DePaul for undergrad okay. in Chicago. And then I moved to New York to go to grad school and Manhattan school of music. And then I stayed in school after I got my master's and I got an artist diploma from the Juilliard school. Mm-hmm. And so when I was at Manhattan school, I got to study with Dick Oates and I got to study with Dave Liebman. Mm-hmm. Oh man, the jazz police is com- they're coming. <laughs> they heard us. Yeah. Wow. No. Uh, so I got to study with these guys, you know, we were, we were learning about like triple triads and stuff from mm-hmm. Dave Liebman. And then when I went to Juilliard, I was studying with Victor Goins and a lot of people that were part of the Lincoln center thing. And so it was a different, it was a different focus. And at the time, you know, a lot of people were just kind of like, well, wow, that's two totally separate things. Like, which one do you like better? Yeah. That was like, okay, well, which school did you like going to better? And it was <laughs> never, that was never, the question just didn't even make sense to me. It's right. what could I get the most, uh, what could I get the most from, from right. either of these, you know? And so I was able to, with it, I tried to stay positive throughout that whole period and tried to be like, okay, what can these, what, what does this teacher offer? What can I work super hard at to get the most out of that mm. situation. And so I started doing that. And then when I finished school, it was like, cool, time to hit Coleman Hawkins, Lester, you know, go through the lineage. Right. So I started doing that. And during those years, post school and really in the woodshed and just, I wasn't working, I wasn't gigging that much. Okay. I was playing whenever I could, but there wasn't that much work for me. So I, and I was teaching a lot up in Westchester and I was teaching doing a lot of private students in Connecticut and, and, and in, in the city and stuff. And so it was during that time when I was starting to play, play in more bands, but, but the work wasn't really, I mean, we, I remember playing a gig on the Lower East side and we made 28 cents each. Whoa. For that gig. You know, so you can't, you can't, you can't buy a meal. You can't even get on the subway for right. that. So, so it was more about, okay, so well, I'm teaching a lot and playing like society and function gigs mm-hmm. for, for, for music, for, for, for rent. And it was during those years where I was like, okay, so I've got students, I've got wedding bands that I'm playing in. I've got arranging work that I'm doing for people that are, that's bringing, I've, I've got copy work that I'm doing that's bringing in money. Mm-hmm. That liberates my music stuff for when I eventually want to make my own records. Okay. That means I can function enough in a functional musical society and role that I don't have to worry about rent in that way. So I don't have to compromise my own creative stuff for any sort of like monetary purposes. Right. And when I started realizing that during those years, I was like, okay, well maybe, but maybe I should like play so I can like uh, be the top bill on every festival. Maybe I should find some way to do that. Mm. And the more years that went by and the more creative bands that I started playing with, that started getting work in Europe and started getting work. that was actually a livable wage and mm-hmm. stuff. Those bands were uncompromising in their music. Right. And so, it, so my philosophy that I developed through those part, through the lean years and along with, getting to play in these bands that were being super creative on an uncompromising level just kind of fed into each other. Right. And now 10 years later, 15 years later, it's like, okay, cool. If I'm going to put out a record, which I, I love making records because that whole process is, is a journey and a learning experience in and of itself. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to make records, it's going to be exactly what, whatever point I want to make with those records or whatever's, point in my musicianship or in my saxophone playing that I want to document right. uh, is right now. Okay. And it doesn't matter if it's a commercial success and it, that's not even the point. Right. And if I am able, and luckily every record that I've made on my record label has made its money back that I put into it and more. Wow. And some, some records slightly more, yeah, just yeah. barely more, but some records like, okay, cool. I'm not going to retire on this extra money, but some records, it's like, cool, that's going to go into a pot where the next record's going to come from some of that money. That's awesome. That's so, saying a lot nowadays, you know, to be able to. Man, I've been, been super lucky, you know, luckily lots of tours that I'm on, whether it's as a leader or a sideman, people are still buying records. That's great. CDs and stuff. And so just, just make, making enough sales with those and through CD baby and Bandcamp and other outlets, um, you know, a European distribution outlets and stuff mm-hmm. like that, where I'm not going to be able to buy a house or something, unfortunately. <laughs> right. but, that, 
but that kind of stuff can help propagate more creative music where I'm not having to worry or cross pollinate different paths and become some sort of careerist in the music, which right. I've seen happen to a lot of my peers and that kind of kills their creative spirit and their drive to make individual music that doesn't depend on sales mm -hmm. or bottom line numbers and stuff like that. And so for me, for better or for worse, at this point, I'm trying to proactively avoid marrying those two, the business and the creative side of the things. That's really inspiring to hear, man, that you're really thinking a lot about it. And um, I think your career is just kind of a testament to really just believing in what you're doing. And eventually, hopefully, it will pay off, you know? Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of hope. It's a lot of trust right. in like, just hard work and perseverance. And I don't necessarily, you know, I was just did a master class here in New York uh, at, a, at a college yesterday. And it was like, do music. If, if you cannot imagine yourself doing anything but music, mm -hmm. that's when I recommend you going into music. Yeah. Because it's freaking difficult. It's, it's, right. it's difficult. It's hard. The monetary thing is not there. You're, you're not going to get rich off of it. But if you cannot see yourself doing anything, but you're going to find a way to make something happen. And so with that philosophy, I'm like, well, so far, and this can change at any time. And I realize that so far I've been able to make a living doing this thing. And so mm -hmm. why not be as creative as possible with it? Why not go stretch my own imagination? Yeah. Since I've been able to you know, so far I've been able to be creative and, and just do my own thing and still make money, uh, playing the music. So it's not really about being a careerist with it. It's about surviving enough to put out over the course of my lifetime, some expanse of records that represent what I loved about right. all aspects of creative music, whether it's in the jazz tradition or whether it's in the 20th century modern classical tradition or mm -hmm. just the most free improv tradition, it doesn't matter just as long as I'm able to say something personal eventually with all these different styles. Well, that's super inspiring, man. So I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but uh, there's something I like to do at the end of every show, which is ask uh, like a certain number of questions. And I ask the same oh. exact questions to everybody. And I love hearing the different responses I get from all the different okay. folks I talk to. So they're just short little questions. Um, so the first one is, what is one educational material that you feel like you couldn't live without? So it could be like, you know, something related to the saxophone, something related to just education in general in life. But what's what's something that you find yourself kind of always coming back to? Man, uh, I'm in the middle of a heavy transcription phase okay. right now. So, I mean, transcribing has been my biggest education to date, besides playing with the bands, like growing bands that I'm part of or leader of. So, yeah, I'm actually in, in the middle of a super insane project where i'm trying to transcribe every coltrane solo wow <laughs> and so it's taken years because part of the lineage you know i went through yeah you know the coleman hawkins the lester young the dexter gordon the sonny rollins and when i got to my the phase where i'm like cool i'm gonna study a bunch of coltrane i realized i'm like okay if i'm listening to these army recordings yeah. on, with him on on alto right right and about 20 years later he's interstellar space that's the same guy. Mm. And 20 years, it can you can look at it as a lot, but in a career, in a lifetime career, that's not a lot of time. I'm like, how did he get from point A to point triple Z? Right. <laughs> with those, those. So I was like, I'm going to try to transcribe as many Coltrane solos as I can so I can try to find the building blocks that led to, because it's the same guy. Right. So how did he get from those army recordings to there's got it there it, maybe it's not a straight line maybe right, it's a right. zigzag with like all these maybe there's black holes involved in yeah. that <laughs> but somehow that same person got to interstellar space mm. and so i wanted to find and for me the answer in my crazy brain was i wanted to transcribe as many solos that have been documented as i can so i could try to find those building blocks wow and it's been years uh, i'm getting close to the end but now that I'm getting close to the end, there's even more questions. Right, of like, course. And there are certain solos that I skipped on the original journey mm -hmm. because I'm like, cool, I don't – originally I'm like listening to all these solos and I'm like, well, this solo I can 
skip because I didn't feel, I didn't feel like there was a new building block mm. that was added to the ones I'm already working on. Mm-hmm. But now, now that I'm getting close to the end, once I get to the end, I'm like, well, now that I've skipped, I've skipped those. So I need to do those ones because right. maybe I have something I missed. Wow. So I still have years ahead of me, but as far as education goes on a saxophonistic and improvisatorial and just philosophical music yeah. thing, like uh, transcribing has been my biggest thing. That's awesome, man. Have you, have you checked out that new Spotify playlist? I forget who, who made it, but it's literally like a complete recorded history of train. Um, and I don't know how long this person spent putting it together, but it's like you said, it's like the early army recordings, you know, through playing with Dizzy and then into Miles. And then it's, it's thousands of songs, but wow. it, is, it is pretty incredible to kind of start at the beginning and just kind of let it play. Um, it's going to take me probably a year to even get through listening to all of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, uh, well, I'm going to look at that because maybe there'll be some hidden ones that, uh, yeah. That I haven't found yet, in which case I need to deal with. Yeah, and I think he might have been he might have been obviously limited by like what's actually on Spotify if there's not everything. Um right. but it, it is pretty incredible and it kind of takes your breath away while you're scrolling through it and you just see how much work he did. Uh and I mean and you know it, the whole thing the, the whole thing for me is it kind of way it's an exercise in futility because mm-hmm. it's known that there's some other tapes that have never been right. released. Yeah. So Robbie's Robbie Coltrane has some. He's probably listened to some things none of us will ever get to hear right, in our right. lifetimes or something. And also, you know, Frank Tiberi. It's known. It's a famous thing that he traveled around and and personally recorded dozens of Coltrane wow. gigs at the time. And so he's got these tapes too. Yeah. And so maybe I'll never get to hear all of those things. So I'll never be able to say I transcribed every Coltrane solo. Right. But uh, with the original goal was to find out how to how this man got to the way he plays on interstellar space. And so right. that's kind of the function of the, the whole project. And I'm, it's taken years and I wanted to quit first <laughs> a, lot, a lot of times, but then I would, I would take a little break and come back at it with renewed vigor on it yeah. and close to the end of his life now. And the things I'm finding are fascinating. Wow, man, that's quite a project that is uh, really, <laughs> really intimidating to think about doing all that. Yeah, yeah. Stay, stay tuned. I'll, I'll, let you know in the future what what the results are. <laughs> Very cool. So, uh, who is the teacher that you feel like made one of the biggest impacts on you, and and why? Uh, well, my very first teacher is this great saxophonist that lives in Arizona and Chicago, mm-hmm. named Greg Fishman. Yeah, Greg's the man. He's been on the show. He's uh, he man. When I started, I thought it was pentatonic scales all the way. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter what's going on underneath. That's it. And I thought I was super cool. That yeah. was it. And Greg really showed me the ropes. He introduced me to the entire jazz. You know, I didn't know anything about jazz history at the time. Mm-hmm. And so he introduced me to that. He's really analytical. He doesn't, you know, theoretically everything needs to have its place, and uh, there needs to, everything needs to be on the grid. And like for me, that was super influential and very important, and the foundation for everything that I do and every way that I think about music. So Greg has been a unbelievable driving force and where, where I come from. And, you know, after I moved to New York, I, well, no, before I moved to New York, I studied with Mark Colby a little bit. Mm-hmm. After I moved to New York, I studied with Dick Oates and Dave Liebman. And I took some lessons from Greg Osby and Jason Moran. And all of these guys have been monumental in my, in my formation, but Greg really started, started everything off. That's so cool to hear. So what is one thing on the on the flip side? What's one thing that you make every single student work on, like no exceptions and, and why? Wow. Uh, eventually, I get get my students to transcribe something. Okay. Um, whether a lot of my tenor students, I'll make them do body and soul, whether they want it or not. Um, and but what's funny is the outcome and part of the byproduct of doing this Coltrane nonstop thing Mm -hmm. is that really what I've come to realize is the transcription process and everything you get out of it is really just a gateway. It's one of those doorways I talked about earlier into where you're going to go eventually with your own music. Yeah. The, the, the the things that, but on top of just the actual notes from body and soul and the sound, trying to recreate that soulful sound that Coleman Hawkins gets every student that I've had do that 
when they can play it to some functional level, I'm like, okay, cool. What are the coolest parts of this solo and why? And the answers have never, with all the dozens of students that I've had that make, that I make do that, there has never been one duplicate answer. Wow. And so I ha I just make my students, I make my students run with whatever answer they come up with and I make them come up with, or we come up to, together with exercises that emphasizes that aspect mm. of what they what they think is so cool about the Coleman Hawkins thing, and those exercises eventually become tunes of their own, and then those tunes hopefully become some part of a, a seed of what their actual playing is going to be. Right, and it's awesome because you look up, you take a step back. Some of these students I've had for years now, or they're not my students anymore, but they look back and they say it was originally a part of the jazz lineage, the history, mm -hmm. the home base of the tenor saxophone. I had to do that work. But then the germ, the seed that came out of it was the thing that I decided was, was cool about that song. Wow. And so the more and more I see students light up from that kind of thinking, yeah. it's like, and the more Coltrane solos I transcribe and the things that I do with, with the, those transcriptions, yeah. um, it's not about just playing it back with it. It's like, okay, well, what, what was the thing here that was super cool, and how can I take that ball and run with it? Right. That's all my own interpretation. That's all my own, my psyche is telling me that part of the solo was cool. Or my student that I'm going to see in 20 minutes, mm -hmm. that's what he saw that was cool. Wow. So the, more, the deeper I get into the transcription thing, I realize it's once you get past the nuts and bolts of it, it's where you take it. And what you see, the light that you find out of those transcriptions. Awesome. awesome. So that's why I have a student transcribe something with that as, as a goal. Yeah, great. So what's uh this this is, you know, obviously related to music, but doesn't have doesn't have a concrete answer. I don't know what I'm trying to say, but what is one personal quality or characteristic that you feel makes somebody successful in the field of music or lends towards being a musician? Yeah. I mean that's such a Double edge, right? right. With a with a successful part, yeah. That that's that's the that's the key word because, you know, I think everybody's idea of success is different, right? And I guess and what so, I what I would mean by successful is, it doesn't have to be in any kind of like tangible sense, um, but somebody that kind of gets enjoyment and loves playing music and keeps doing it, you know? I guess yeah, yeah, be it. yeah. And, and that's that's a way more fun question to answer. <laughs> You know, with that interpretation of the right. successful, I, I think it's about whenever you play, even during the warm ups, mm -hmm. having a, a, a spirit of discovering some undisco something undiscoverable. Cool. Even if even if you're playing long tones or something like that, you keep your uh, imagination active. And, you know, it's funny, like Steve, there's a great. Steve Lacey quote where he talks about he would play long tones for hours each day. Mm -hmm. And he says, if you play that low B flat after like 30 or 45 minutes, the B flat starts to take over the room and you inhabit different parts of the room. Wow. For me, that's just, man, that's, that's amazing. Right. That's such a great philo philosophy and, and such a great way to live. Yeah. So nothing becomes in mundane because you're always looking for something kind of fun or something kind of imaginative, imaginative within whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. So, so whenever, as long as I can, every moment that I'm playing, it's something. There's some energy, there's some positive energy of discovery that you're trying to do, and if you can stick to that, you'll eventually find wherever you're trying to go. And for me, that's the successful part. So the very last one. Uh, this is more of a concrete question. What's the best uh, purchase you've made related to music or saxophone or whatever, like in the past year or so, that's under or around a hundred bucks? That's like accessible to most people out there. Anything cool that you've you've purchased? <laughs> okay, until you said the uh, hundred bucks thing, I was gonna say, I was gonna say that mezzo soprano saxophone and right. the slide saxophone. Yep. Um, I. Uh, would highly recommend there is a red leather bound book that's about this big okay. of all six of the Bartok string quartets. Oh, cool. Um, I bought that more than a year ago, but mm -hmm. over the last two or three years, I've, I brought that book everywhere with me and I've studied 
as much as a person who didn't formally study that kind of music and stuff, I've d- done as much work as I p- can yeah. and I'm going to keep trying to do, but, uh, there's so much information and so much great stuff that's applicable to improvisation yeah. in there that I would highly recommend that. Okay. It's like such a great purchase. I'm definitely going to write that down. That is awesome. Cool, man. Well, that, that kind of brings us to the end. I want to really thank you for being so generous with your time and uh, dropping a lot of knowledge, knowledge on us. Is there a place uh, that people can get in touch with you if they want to reach out, say hi? Yeah, definitely. Um, I have a Facebook music page. Okay. So, so it's facebook.com slash John Arabagon music. Okay. All lowercase, one word, no spaces or whatever. And uh, just like the page and... Um, any like feel free to write a message there any questions any comments if you love my stuff if you hate my stuff just <laughs> get in touch and it's all good and i'm just happy to be a part of this whole music world and community awesome yeah. well thanks so much for taking the time man. it's been a real pleasure speaking with you thanks nick so there you have it my interview with john arabagon such a fun time talking to him as it always is Really nice guy, one of the best saxophone players in the known universe. Maybe even after taking some of those black holes, he's going to be the best saxophone player in other universes as well. Uh, But really talking to him is a pleasure, and he has such a great way of explaining things and kind of uh, letting us know where he's coming from. And I think it really adds a lot uh, when I listen to his music, knowing some of the stuff that is behind it all and talking about some of the other things he does in his life that inform his saxophone playing and his teaching and all that good stuff. So thanks again for tuning in. We really hope you enjoyed that one. We'll be coming at you next week with a brand new interview. Remember to go and check out the website, saxophonepodcast.com. Hop on the mailing list. Leave us a rating and review. And most importantly, the, the best thing that you can do for us here at Everything Saxophone Podcast is to just share this with people that you know. Share it on social media. Tell your friends about it. Um, tell your students about it. Anybody you think might enjoy this. That's that's really the way that these shows kind of catch on with the communities that they're meant to be uh, beneficial towards. So thanks again, everybody. We will see you next week with a brand new episode. Have an awesome weekend, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.